This morning, we continue in our summertime reflection of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, a passage of Scripture we find in Matthew chapters 5 through 7, one of the most well-known and beloved portions of Scripture in all of the Bible, and for good reason. It is powerful teaching by the Lord Himself on what it means to be a Christian as the the people are moving away from traditional righteousness and the law and all the ways they thought about how to be a holy person. And Jesus is transforming them and renewing them and showing them how to be servants of the kingdom. It's a powerful portion of Scripture. And over the summer, we've been looking at it in a series that I'm calling Summer on the Mount. And we'll continue that this morning as we look at Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 25. Jesus, speaking to the crowd, says this, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. Do not worry about what you will eat or drink or about your body or what you will wear. Isn't your life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you more valuable than the birds? Can any one of you add a single hour to your life by worrying? So obviously, the topic that Jesus is speaking on this morning is the topic of worry. Anyone here ever tempted to worry about anything? No hands in the air? Well, I'll just go right to the benediction. We're good. (laughs) I assume that you'll be, maybe next uh, Sunday we'll be talking about honesty. (laughs) When Jesus says, I tell you, do not worry about your life. How does that strike you? You know, there are a lot of ways that we could take this passage, we could apply it, we could interpret it, we could uh, put it in place in our life. And, but what we want to do this morning is really hone in, n- not on what do we think this verse means or, or how do we want to apply this, but we want to know what did Jesus mean when He said these words on the side of that mountain? What did Jesus mean when He said to the followers, do not worry? As we start to unpack this passage of Scripture, I want to I start with something that really struck me as I explored and studied this passage this week, and that's the presence of this Greek word, marimna. Now, if you see members of our Wednesday morning men's group giving each other side looks, that's for this reason, because I've told them many times that one of the, the outs you have as a pastor is when somebody asks you a question that you don't know how to answer, just start talking about the Greek and the Hebrew and keep rambling on about the original language, and eventually everybody's so confused and they can't challenge you and pin you down anyway. But that's not exactly what's happening this morning. I want to talk to you about this fascinating word, marimna. In this passage of Scripture, when Jesus says, do not marimna, we translate that in English to worry. But there are other places in the New Testament where we see this Greek word marimna. For example, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 20, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Philippi. He is talking about Timothy, his assistant, who is coming to pastor to them. And he says to the Philippians, he says, there is no one that I know of that has genuine marimna for you like Timothy. But do you know how we translate marimna in that passage? Concern. Uh, Paul says, I don't know of anybody else who has concern for you, genuine concern for you, like Timothy does. Now let's think about the dynamic here of this Greek word marimna. When it is used in a context or a situation where we are being warned about something potentially detrimental, when we see the word marimna, we translate it into the English word worry. 
But when we see it in another context where it demonstrates something, an attribute, perhaps maybe we would strive for, we look at that Greek word marimna and we translate it into concern. What exactly is the difference between worry and concern? From from a biblical perspective, the difference must be pretty subtle if we can just use the same Greek word and translate it into one of two English words depending on the nuances of the context, then at the heart, this Greek word must be pretty close. What's the difference between worry and concern? Why are there instances when God elevates the idea of being concerned? Certainly we understand that God wants us to be concerned about our lives. It's an attribute of wisdom. Throughout Scripture, God calls us to be aware of how we exercise our time, our talents, our energies, where our focus goes, where our priorities are. All of these are things that demonstrate concern, awareness, attentiveness, proactivity in our life. So there's an element of marimna, concern, that is positive. And yet here in this passage of Scripture, Jesus tells us, rather, I, would, I would say rather warns us, do not marimna, do not worry. This is much stronger than a suggestion. In fact, it's imperative command language. It is a warning from our Lord that worry is detrimental. And I tell you what, as we know more about modern medicine, as we examine the the impact of worry and stress and anxiety on ourselves, on our physical body, on our spiritual body, on our emotional health, our mental health, we realize that Jesus is telling us the truth. Worry, anxiety, fear, stress are all very detrimental to our health. What's the difference between worry and concern? What's that nuance that makes it positive or negative? I once heard somebody say the difference between worry and concern is prayer. Somebody here told me that. Was it Shirley? Shirley, did you tell me that? We talked about it. Okay. Well, take credit for it. I think if I remember correctly, it was you. That, that's good. You know, that kind of gets us on the right path here. The difference between worry and concern is prayer or connection to God or what I would say, bringing God into the equation. Whatever is tempting us to be worried or anxious or stressed out, when we add God to the equation, we move toward concern. Let me share with you, as I was uh, looking at this, I looked up an article. This is an, uh, comes from an article by, written by a, a man named Caleb Suko, who was a missionary to the Ukraine. And, and if you don't know much about what's happening in the Ukraine, Ukraine and the missionaries there, you can ask Bill Glover. Bill will tell you they have a lot to be concerned and potentially worried about. There's a lot of challenges in the Ukraine. And so uh, Caleb uh, Suko writes this book, What If... How to Kill Worry and Anxiety Before It Kills You. That's kind of a title that would make me worry. But anyway, here are some of the distinctions he points out between concern and worry. He says, concern tends to be focused on others. Worry tends to be self-centered. Concern motivates us and often prompts us to constructive action. Worry tends to paralyze us with fear or uncertainty. When I think about that principle there, I think about as we think and we go through life and we start to think and anticipate the next chapter of life that is coming. You know, if we are concerned about what to do next, you know, that might lead us to some proactive action. We, we uh, apply to the college or we dust, up our, or dust off our resume or we get some skills and additional training or certification or we plan uh, in strategic financial investments. You know, when we're concerned concerned about something, we proactively address it. When we're worried, we can feel overwhelmed. It can lead us to be completely distracted, even lead us to, to addictions or other ways of escaping whatever situation or stressor is causing us to worry. Caleb goes on, he says, concern is often driven by love, worry tends to be driven by fear. 
If we look around at the state of our world and we're a little uncertain, concern would prompt us to get involved. Where can I serve? Where can I take a leadership position? Where can I be a part of problem solving with some of the issues the world is facing, whether it's in my community or a local organization or in our nation or around the world? How can I be involved in being the solution? Whereas worry often leads us to grumbling, complaining, feeling overwhelmed and helpless. He goes on, concern tends to strengthen our relationships and connection to each other. Worry tends to uh, weaken them. Concern is tempered with faith. Worry overwhelms us with fear and doubt. I love that. Concern is tempered with faith. Whatever situation is facing us, when we add the element of faith, the element of trust, our connection to God, our belief and understanding in who God is, then it leads to concern, proactive resolution to whatever is in front of us that could cause us worry. And I think about so many individuals in, scriptures, in Scripture in so many instances when God called them forward. And whatever God was calling them to do could cause them great worry, great fear, great anxiety, but instead of being overwhelmed with fear and worry and anxiety, they turned it to concern, to trust, and to action. They built an ark. They didn't have to be afraid of the flood. They packed up their things to go to the promised land because that's where God called them to. They dropped their nets and followed Him. Whatever God was calling them to that could potentially fill them with great fear, great uncertainty, and great anxiety, they turned it to concern by taking the right measures. When we worry, we often perseverate on things that are out of our control. When we are concerned, we often proactively take steps to bring about resolution. As I thought about this principle this week, <laughs> Sarah and I were, were talking about it, and, and she brought up the parable of the talents. Remember this parable in Matthew 25? Jesus is explaining to His disciples that He's about to leave this earth, and so He tells them this parable about a master who is preparing to leave, but He says, don't worry, while I'm gone, I'm going to give you talents so you can continue doing what the master is doing. He calls three servants. He gives one of them five talents, one of them three talents, and one of them one talent. The master goes away for a while, and then he comes back to settle the accounts with the individuals. Now, if you'll remember, the one with five talents doubled it and made it ten. The one with three talents doubled it, made it uh, six. The one with one talent uh, it hit it in the ground and returned the one talent. But when we think about the principles of this parable, how it demonstrates the difference between concern and worry, think about it. First of all, the first principle of this parable is God is good. The master gave every one of the servants a provision, something that they could use, something that could bless them. All of the servants wanted to please the master. They, they could either lead them to concern and proactivity or to worry and inactivity. The first two servants were concerned. They wanted to please the master, otherwise they wouldn't have put it to work, this money to work, and, and doubled it. But their concern led them to the right action, to invest it, to put it to work, to work hard. But it was the third servant who was afraid, who hid what was given to him. Look what he said. I knew that you are a hard man, investing where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered. I was afraid and I went out and I hid your gold in the ground. Here's what belongs to you. See, the problem is his worry, his fear, anxiety paralyzes him. And so he does nothing. And you, you want to know what I think is the biggest problem in this parable? Why he chose worry, fear, anxiety over concern, diligence, planning, action? I think it's because he didn't know who God was. I knew that you're a hard man. I was afraid. 
Is, is there anybody in this room that thinks that if that parable was told a little differently and the master returned and one of the servants said to the master, you know what, I took the talent you gave me, I did the very best I could, I tried so hard, I gave it my best effort, but this happened and that happened and this happened and I lost everything. Is there anybody in this room that thinks that for whatever reason, if the parable were told that way, that the master would be angry with the servant? I don't. Because I think it totally negates the concept of grace. What the master is upset about when he returns to the one talent servant is that he did nothing. He was paralyzed by fear and anxiety and uncertainty. And the master says, if you knew me, if you knew what I was capable of, why didn't you at least put my talent that I gave you on, on loan in a bank and at least get the interest if you truly knew who I was? See, I think that's the key, friends. When we talk about the difference between worry and concern, one of the, the key things we have to understand is we've got to know who God is. The only remedy to worry is knowing who's with us. In fact, as we focus on this point, I want to go back to Matthew 6 because I'm, I'm thinking there's probably at least a couple people in this room that are about ready to raise their hand because there's a word we haven't talked about for the first 15 minutes of this sermon. You can't believe we skimmed over it. But go back to Matthew chapter 6. Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. Now those of you who know me, who join us for Bible study, which word are we going to talk about next? Therefore, who said it? Hey, Ellen, all right. You get an extra piece of cake at the reception, all right? Corner piece, whatever you want. Therefore, we know how powerful this word is in Scripture. Jesus says, therefore, do not worry about your life. Meaning, Jesus is not telling us to not worry about our life in a vacuum. This word, therefore, connects what he is saying to what he just said. And here's what he just said. Just hit the rewind a little bit. We're going to go back to Matthew 6, 19. He says this, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be. So after Jesus goes on this description of the reality of heaven, He says, therefore, do not worry about your life. What, what does that mean? Think about what Jesus is saying to us. What does heaven represent? Victory. Victory for God's people. Victory, eternal victory, secured by God on our behalf, despite what happens in your life here on this earth, heaven represents ultimate victory. Moss and vermin destroy your treasures on earth. That's not going to happen in heaven. Thieves break in and steal, take things away from you. Things are stolen from you in heaven, or I'm sorry, stolen from you on earth, whether it's your, your health or your independence or your friends or your relationships. Whatever's taken away from you on earth, it's not going to happen in heaven. Jesus is telling us because of heaven, because of victory, do not worry about your life, do not be anxious. Do not be stressed out. Do not be fearful. See, you've got to add to whatever situation it is and you're facing in your life that's tempting you to worry, tempting you to stress out, tempting you to be anxious. You've got to add to that faith and not just any faith. Faith in the God of all things. Faith in God who has secured eternal victory for you out of His incredible love for you. You have got to add to whatever situation you are facing faith in the God of gods, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, because He is on your side. Whatever it is that is tempting you to be anxious or fearful, you don't have to be worried. God is with you. You know, if I walked into a room full of big, burly guys and they were upset with me, I'd be a little anxious. Unless I turned around and Mike Tyson and Conor McGregor and 
I don't know, who are some of the other? Andre the Giant, Hulk Hogan, they're all behind me. I'm aging myself. I know those guys are like 60 now. I, I know Andre's passed away, hasn't he? That's, well, I'd really be impressed if Andre was behind me. I'd be fearless then. Angel Andre. See how that just take away your fear when you, you recognize the power that is at your back, the power that surrounds you, the strength that you have? That is, that's exactly what Jesus is saying. Because of heaven, because of the victory we have, do not worry. Trust God to take care of what God's got to take care of. You, be concerned to take care of what you need to take care of. You see, we have a lot of jurisdiction in our life. We have a lot of freedom. When you go back, go back to the first pages of Scripture, the first story that we have, the story of creation, there's a lot of jurisdiction given to humans and freedom. I don't know, you want to eat the fruit? Looks pretty good. We're not supposed to. It does look tasty. I'm a little hungry. Do you realize the amount of jurisdiction that is given to humanity in their freedom? I think what Jesus would say is, what's under your jurisdiction, the freedom you have, be concerned about it. Be wise. Be strategic. Be proactive. But what's outside of your jurisdiction, what is outside of your capacity, you know what? Trust God. And we recognize, friends, that there are things in our life that we can control and things that we can't. We can't control a global pandemic. We can't control someone else's actions. We can't even control what someone else thinks of us. We can try. There's things we can do to try and influence it, but the reality is sometimes people just decide they don't like you. And certainly as someone who's served in leadership positions, I've experienced that. Even with people you try to love well and encourage to the best of your ability and, and you walk with through life and they just make a decision. They don't like you. You can't control that. You can't control whether or not the company offers you the position, whether the admissions office accepts your application. You can't control whether the person calls you back and says, yes, I'll, I'll go on a date. We can't control global politics. We can't control eternal realities. We can't control when someone else has a stroke of good luck or we have a stroke of bad luck. But we can control our effort, our energies, our attitude, our words, our spiritual disciplines, our personal habits. And all of those things might lead to some of the opportunities that are offered to us, some of the people that say yes, some that say no, how people respond or how they uh, take us. Some, some of those have some impact. But I think if Jesus were to just pack this together for us today, he'd say, look, I want you to be concerned with, attentive to, proactive, and the things you can control. And I want you to stop worrying about, stressing over, being anxious about the things you can't control. And you know what I recognize? This is what makes life hard. Even when we do the best to control what's under our jurisdiction, what's under our capacity, things don't always work out the way we want them to. In fact, in just a minute, Leah's going to lead us in a a beautiful song. Janet's going to play on the piano. We're going to invite you to come forward. Light a luminary. Some of these will be lit in honor of someone who has battled this disease and experienced victory in this life. Some of these will be lit in memory of someone who has battled this disease and experienced victory in the life to come. Now I want you to hear how I said that. Because I have a firm, unshakable trust and belief that everybody who will have a candle lit in their name has experienced victory. Some in this life, some in the life to come. I've been your pastor here for seven and a half, almost eight years now. You know I'm wrong about things sometimes. 
probably more than you'd like. There's one thing that I'm pretty sure, absolutely positive I'm not wrong about, it's this. My wholehearted conviction, unwavering belief, if I had to wager it all on one position, it would be this. I guarantee you, there is no one in heaven that looks around at the glory around them, looks around at their existence, and looks back at earth and says, man, I wish I could go back. Now that's hard for us. The loss, the separation, the pain is difficult. At the end of the day, if we know God, if we know what God has done, if we look at Jesus' words, therefore, heaven, because of heaven, we have victory. We trust that our loved ones or in a glory beyond anything we will ever be able to imagine until we're standing in the midst of it. That's the difference between concern and worry. Jesus says, do not worry about your life. Those things, do the best you can with what you can control, and those things you can't control, trust God. Trust that God is going to work them out in a way that would blow your mind. And where do we go from here? As I looked at a way to summarize this message, I realized something. I don't really think there's any brand new information here today. In fact, as I think about some of the messages I've shared with you over the last seven and a half years, I realized, you know, I think I preached on all of these principles somewhere along the way. So I don't think the challenge for us today as God's people is, how do I process all of this brand new information? I think the challenge for us is, how do I take what I've heard? What's been restated, what it's been reminded of, and apply it to my life? And put it in place so that I can experience God's victory over worry, over fear, over anxiety. Amen.